All right, so let's take a look at the bleed system. So this gives you an overall picture of the entire bleed system. And as we mentioned before in one of the other subjects we were talking about, we said there are a 10th stage, there's a 10th stage system and a 14th stage system, completely separate from each other. The 10th stage system, what we have on the engine, it's the yellow colored line. It's, we have two bleed air ports on each engine um, taking air off the 10th stage of the compressor. That's supplied along to a 10th stage bleed valve, which is controlled by a switch on the um, overhead panel, on the bleed panel switch, and also is controlled automatically during an engine start. And we'll take a look at that later. There's a couple of wired up wiring diagrams we need to go through, and we'll go through that later. Um, the APU air feeds into the 10th stage system and it's plumbed into the left hand system. And, and as you can see, the APU only feeds into the 10th stage, it doesn't feed into the 14th. So the 10th stage air is used for starting and it's used to run the air conditioning packs. And there's also an external high pressure external air connection that we can plug in and actually we can use that as a source of air. Normally you would use it to start the engine. But there's no real reason why you couldn't use it to run the packs as well, but I don't think anyone does. We've got splitting the two sides up, the left and right side. In the centre, we've got an isolation valve, a 10th stage isolation valve. So that's controlled by an isolation switch. It's normally closed and sometimes we open it if we need to. If we've only got a single bleed operation, we can open it up and allow the remaining bleed system to feed both air conditioning packs, for example. And also that isolation valve will need to be opened if we're doing an across engine start, or if we're using the APU to start the right hand engine, that, that isolation valve would have to open to allow the air to go through to the other side. So that will also form part of the, starts, the start sequence and it opens automatically when you push the start engine start button. On the 14th stage side of things, we've got a 14 stage bleed diode duct, just a single port on the engine, a 14 stage isolation valve, We've got, um, we're going to use the 14 stage to run the anti-ice system. So it's the engine and wing anti-ice. And we also use the 14 stage air to provide air for the reverse thrust system. <clears throat> and we were talking about that I th when we were doing one of the other subjects, um, the ice and rain. So during reverse thrust operation, that takes priority. So the anti-ice uh, valve, if you remember, closes during the reverse thrust operation. But that's what we use the 14th stage for. And we've got um, two bleed air shutoff valves, 14 stage bleed air shutoff valves. They're controlled by a 14 stage switch on the bleed panel. We've got the wing anti-ice valves controlled by the wing anti-ice switch. There's an isolation valve in the center, so we can tie the two sides together if we need to. The isolation valves and the bleed air valves for the 14th stage are energized to close, whereas in the 10th stage system, the isolation valve and the 10th um, stage bleed air valves, they're energized to open. Um, this picture here really just shows you the same information as on the previous picture, except it hasn't got the uh, control switches showing. But the reason I put it on here is just want to highlight, you see the dotted lines around the tubes, around the delivery pipe work. Um, those dotted lines represent a leak detection system. So you can see that pretty much once the air gets on the engine, every inch of pipe is monitored for leaks. And we'll take a look at it a bit later on. And once a leak is detected, the crew need to take some action to um, isolate the system. Um, but we'll take a look at that a bit later on, but that's the reason I've put this picture on here. It doesn't really show you much more information than was on the previous slide, actually. So here we can see the control panel, the bleed air control panel. Um, we've got the 14 stage switches, so the left and right bleed switches for the 14 stage, the isolation switch. Um, and then we've got the 10 stage, so feeding in 10 stage, remember you've got the APU as well. So you've got the two engine bleed switches, the APU load control valve switch, and the isolation switch. Then there's a duct monitor selector.
for testing the leaking system, uh, the duct leakage system, and um, a position normal loop A, loop B. And we'll talk about um, that switch when we look at the duct um, leak detection system. For indication of um, um, bleed information on the um, ICAS secondary page, there is a bleed pressure indication that's giving you the bleed pressure that's in the 10th stage duct. This is showing the routing of the 10th stage ducting, which is over the top. That's over the top of the APU compartment. So you have a supply from each engine. You've got a supply from the APU, which is plumbed into the left-hand system. You've got two outputs going to the ACU valve, so that's the air conditioning unit valve. Um, and there's also an external air connection which is plumbed into the left-hand system. And then you've got the isolation valve in the middle just above the, on, just above the APU um, compartment. What this picture doesn't show is all the other jumble of pipes that are in there for the wing anti-ice system, the 14th stage system, and all the whole load of uh, air conditioning pipes in the actual air conditioning system itself. This is all in the aft equipment bay, of course. When you go up in the aft equipment bay, it gets, it's quite a jumble of pipes up in there um, because there is a lot of stuff up in there. This is just showing the 10th stage system. So we're going to walk through this operation of the 10th stage valve. Okay, so we can see there it's a electrically controlled valve and it's energized to open it. So on the valve itself, we've got a solenoid. And let's assume actually this is the left-hand side. So we've got an air supply coming off the 10th stage from the engine. It comes along here and it's gonna hit the butterfly valve, which at the moment is closed. That air is also sensed up this line here through the sensing selector, which is just a shuttle valve really. And it comes down to a relief valve so we're regulating effectively the pressure in this line to the solenoid. And when we energize the solenoid, the air is now allowed to be ported to this top chamber of the opening chamber, and it pushes it down and it opens up the valve and allows the air to flow. We've also got a micro switch, and once it's away from the fully closed position by eight degrees, that will now be considered open and it gives an open indication to the DCU. The reason we have these two lines here, these two sensing lines here, we've got one here, and there's also another one here, and then you've got the sensing selector, the shuttle valve, is because we do need to open the isolation valve, sorry, the bleed air valve, on an engine that is being started. So if you're starting the engine, using the other engine as a source of air, there are three valves that need to open. The bleed valve on the engine that's supplying the air, of course, the isolation valve, and the isolation and the bleed air valve of the engine that is being started. But the engine that's being started, there's obviously no air supply coming from it to act as the muscle air to open the valve. So the air in that case has to come from the other engine, or could be the APU, for example. So in that case, the air supply from the APU or the other engine is coming up here, pushes the sensing selector across, comes down to the solenoid valve in a normal way, it gets energized and it opens it up and now it allows air to flow. It doesn't go into the engine per se because there's a check valve later on down here, but it goes into the line that's available to uh, the air start control valve. So we're going to walk through the level control now for the um, 10th stage. So we've got some power supplies here. We've got our isolation valve, one for the left, uh, sorry, the bleed air valve, one for the left, one for the right, and the isolation valve in the center. We'll just go through controlling of one for now. And over here, we've got the left engine uh, bleed valve, energized open, of course. 
we've got our isolation valve uh, in the 10 stage system, energized open, and then there's the right one here, energized open as well. So let's take a look um, um, at the left hand one. So we know if we energize this solenoid, boom, 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 the bleed valve will open. Very simple then, we push the 10th stage bleed switch and that will allow power to come from the DC essential bus through the closed set of contacts and it comes along to this relay here. This relay is the ACU protection relay. We'll talk about it in just a second, but at the moment we'll assume this relay is relaxed and as long as it's relaxed, everything is good. The power supply then goes through that diode and it comes along here to the next hurdle that has to go through, which is the left engine fire shutoff relay. And this will normally be in the, in the same position it is here. The only time it goes into the other position is if you have an engine fire and you push the fire push switch. Once you push the fire push switch, that's going to interrupt the power supply to the bleed valve. So amongst all the other things that happen, um, you know, the engine shuts down and all the rest of it, then the um, um, bleed air valve will close because it gets de-energized. But assuming we haven't got a fire then, power now goes along here, boom, 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 and it energizes and it opens up. Once it opens up, the, D, the um, DCU, once it goes more than eight degrees from, open, from closed, the DCU will lose the ground signal from the position micro switch. If it loses the ground signal from the position micro switch, the DCU assumes that it's open and gives us all the indications. If the position micro switch is eight degrees or less and fully closed, then the DC sees a ground signal there, so it knows the valve is closed. Um, for the isolation valve, which is here, that's controlled by the isolation switch. So we have a DC essential bus power supply once again. We push the isolation switch in and it comes down through here, through the right hand ACU protection relay. That's um, the first hurdle. It then goes up to the left hand ACU protection relay. Again, we'll talk about these in a minute. Comes along through there, down through there, and boom, 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 and the isolation valve opens. And once again, we've got a micro switch that sends a signal. This time it gets a, the DCU gets a ground signal when it's open because we give an indication that it's open. So the DCU knows the 10 stage isolation valve is open and it puts on all the respective lights in the switch from the lamp driver unit, which is here. And it illuminates the open light. For the Obviously, in normal flight condition, this will be closed, and in normal flight, this will be open, and we employ a dark cockpit principle. So that switch will be dark normally, this switch will be dark. When you have an abnormal condition, i.e. one of the bleed valve is closed, then the closed light illuminates. Or if you have an abnormal condition and the isolation valve is open, then you illuminate the open light. That's done by the lamp driver unit under a signal from the DCU, and the DCU is looking at these position micro switches to work out what's going on. <clears throat> Similar thing going on for the right hand one. So for the right hand side, we get a DC Buzz 2 power supply this time. Through, we push the switch in to open it, boom, boom, boom. Passes through the ACU protection relay. Passes through the fire push switch, which is normally not pushed. And bush. Boom, boom, boom. We've energized the right hand one and it's open. Now, what we also said was during an engine start, the we need to open three valves. We need to open all three valves during an engine start. If we're using the engine as an air supply, if you're using the APU as an air supply, you, you only need two valves opening. But you um, need to open these three valves. And we said it's automatic regardless of the switch position of all the main 10th stage bleed switches, the isolation bleed, uh, the isolation switch and the, the other bleed switch. They can all be switched off, it doesn't matter. When you push the start push button, this is a left engine start. 
if you push the left engine start push button a ground signal will be sent to this start relay and a cutout speed switch and and there's a speed switch on the air turbine starter that will cause a cutout signal during the start so it automatically closes everything so during the initial engine start the start relay is energized and the ground signal is provided via the speed switch so this start relay here energizes and it puts power supply this time from the battery bus and it comes down to this through this die to this node and it goes off in effectively three directions it comes through here through the fire push switch and energizes the left it comes down here and energizes the isolation and it comes down here and energizes via the right hand fire push button the right hand bleed switch everything opens up until we reach we get to 50% uh, roughly, I think it is. This will then provide a, or uh, remove the ground signal. And this relay de-energizes and everything opens up. <coughs> okay, now then, just going back here for a second, we've got these two relays here. These are the ACU protection relays. So we're gonna look at them when we look at the air conditioning system. But basically, it's linked into the air conditioning system and is monitoring for an overpressure condition in the air conditioning system of more than 53 PSI. We will cover it again in the air conditioning. And if, this, if there's an overpressure condition in the air conditioning system, uh, a couple of things are going to happen. Number one, the air conditioning valve will close. But also, as a double protection measure, um, this will also close the bleed valve, the actual 10th stage bleed valve. So if the ACU is in an overpressure condition, boom, the ACU protection relay uh, energizes. And let's see what happens. Well, let's look at what happens. Look, once that's energized and those switch contacts go, there, those two contacts are going to join together and boom, we've got a ground signal. This creates a latching circuit. Once the bleed system, of course, is switched off and the air conditioning system is switched off, the pressure will drop to zero virtually instantly. And of course, the pressure switch will go back to a low pressure condition and you would lose that ground signal there. What you don't want to do is for this protection relay to now de-energize and relax because then everything sort of starts up again. So that's why they've created this latching circuit. So once it's been energized, it's latched, and it doesn't matter now about this pressure switch. That will open, and it will lose the ground signal, but it doesn't matter because the ground signal is there. So that will cause the left, in this case, it's the left one. So that will cause the left bleed valve to close because it gets de-energized. And also, the isolation valve, if it was open, will also close. And it will be prevented from being open as well. So the crew can't try and open up the ice. If they have an overpressure condition, obviously they're going to lose the pack. They're going to lose that engine bleed. Uh, the crew can't say, oh, um, I know, we can open up the isolation valve and get the other side to feed it. That's not going to be able to happen. Because if they do, we can see from the electrical diagram, okay, the right ACU pack's okay, but the left ACU pack is over pressure, so that you lose the power to energize the uh, isolation valve. Okay. Um, and also you'll notice that that protection is bypassed during an engine start. Okay, obviously that takes precedence to start the engine. If it was shut down, we need to be able to start the engine. We don't care about the overpressure. We need to be able to start the engine. So um, the, in terms of the engine start, that will allow everything to energize 
down through there, look. And it doesn't matter about this protection relay if they're over pressure because it's, it's using a completely separate power supply and it's bypassing this part of the circuitry here. Okay. Um, once, if, it does, if we do get an overpressure condition, okay, and it latches as we've seen, the only way to reset it is to basically switch off the switch and then reset it, and, well, and reselect it back on. That might try and work, because when you switch off the switch, you lose the power to the relay, so it will de-energize. Once it's de-energized, that goes all back to this position here. Um, and if we now switch it back on, then... Um, as long as there's a low pressure, which there will be initially, uh, everything can open up again. But if there is an overpressure again, it latches off once again. So uh, I think that's about it. It's pretty straightforward. So just remember, when you do a start, everything opens up automatically and then closes everything once it's all finished the start. Then we can then select things on. Okay, then we can select things on ourselves. Um, if we have an overpressure condition in the air conditioning system, it shuts down the air conditioning system, but it will also shut down this, the respective um, pack, or not pack, sorry, the respective bleed supply, the bleed source from the left or right side. And during that situation of an overpressure, we won't be able to open the isolation valve. So that will be force closed. Okay, good. We'll go on to the next slide. We're going to go through the APU bleed electrical control diagram in just a second, but before we do that, just want to mention this. There is an interlock between the APU load control valve and the left bleed switch. That's a 10 stage bleed switch that will prevent the APU from uh, load control valve opening if the left engine bleed switch is in the on position. It's, and it's the switch position that's the crucial thing. It's not interested in the actual valve position, it's the switch position. Now the left, the APU feeds into the left bleed. So as long as the isolation valve is closed, it doesn't matter about the right engine bleed because the APU doesn't feed into it. But there is a similar similar interlock between the right bleed switch and the load control valve if the isolation valve is open. Because we don't want the APU and the engine bleed kind of paralleling together. Therefore, to start the engine, the bleed switches must be off. The bleed switches must be off. The bleed control switches, the 10th stage, left and right, and the isolation to prevent the load control valve being closed. So normally you would use the APU to start the engine, normally. Um, and it's the recommended thing to do. You certainly need it to start the first engine, unless you're using external air. But the bleed switches must be off. Otherwise, the load control valve won't work. Now you couldn't see that on the previous electrical diagram because it didn't show the interlock. Um, but we will see it on the next picture. Okay, what we're going to do is go through the electrical control for this interlock that we've just mentioned. Obviously, the reason we didn't see it on the electrical diagram for the control of the 10th stage valve is because this interlock system, as we mentioned, is nothing to do with the valve position, it's to do with the switch position. And we're going to go through that now. So this is the interlock for the APU load control valve. The load control valve is just another name for an APU bleed valve. And we can see the APU bleed valve or load control valve is here and it's energized open. Now we're not worried too much about this circuit, this part of the circuit down here. We're going to cover that when we look at the APU system. This is to do with the APU starting. What we have controlling the APU is the electronic control unit. And the electronic control unit looks after the APU. It manages the start sequence. It uh, shuts down the APU when we need to. <clears throat> uh, shuts down the APU if there's any faults. And once the APU gets up to speed, it gives a basically a ready to load signal 
and allows the APU generator to come online and the APU bleed system to come online, and that's what we're interested in. So here's a low control valve. There's the ground signal. What we need is power coming from here. Now the power will actually come from the ECU itself, from over here. So um, we'll go through it properly when we do the APU, but basically once the APU is up on speed and it's more than 95%, Internal power is supplied from the ECU through that relay, the 95% relay, which is this relay here is effectively a ready to load relay. Through this load control valve circuit where it's looking at the EGT. So if the EGT starts to get too high, it basically um, um, will close the load control valve to m keep the APU EGT within limits. As long as there are no faults with the APU, we get power along here and we have to go through a load of fences and jump over a load of hurdles before we can get power to here. So the first one that we have to go through is this switch here which is the left hand bleed switch. So the left hand engine bleed switch must be in the off position. If it's in the on position, the actual switch is in the on position, we're going nowhere. Then we have we come along to the next fence we have to jump, which is to do with um, if we trace, trace that dotted line up here, the isolation valve. Now, um, if the isolation valve is switched off, then everything is good, and basically it bypasses the right uh, uh, the um, right hand bleed switch because it doesn't matter about the right hand bleed because the APU bleed is feeding into the left side so it doesn't matter about the right hand bleed as long as the isolation is off so if the isolation is off that's good it then comes to here this is the APU bleed switch itself which obviously must be on so we have to switch on the APU bleed boom 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 this is K1WG is the APU shutoff relay for the fire. So as long as there's no APU fire, boom, 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 we open up the load control valve. So the switches are the key thing. The switch positions are the key thing. So the right hand bleed, the left hand bleed must always be switched off. The right hand bleed can be switched on as long as the isolation is switched off. But if the isolation is open, then the, um, if the isolation valve is open, then the right hand bleed switch must also be um, um, closed. And then obviously we have to select the APU on and then away we go. Okay, and that's it. So that's the interlock for the APU load valve. As I say, don't worry about this down here because we're gonna cover it when we do the APU. So this picture is just showing the 14th stage manifold this time and this time you can see we have a single takeoff port on the engine. It comes down to the bleed valve, the 14th stage bleed shutoff valve and this time the pipework is rooted underneath at the bottom of that bay underneath the APU compartment and in the centre you've got your um, isolation valve. Um, you've also got just almost next door to the bleed valve, just downstream a little bit, the um, wing anti-ice valve, all in that um, aft equipment bay. So this is the 14 stage isolation valve. Um, it's, it, it works in the opposite sense to the 10 stage valve in, in that we have to energize it to close it and if we de-energize it, defaults to open. But it works in a similar way in terms of it uses air pressure as muscle air to open it. So we have an airflow coming from the supply, coming along from the left, comes to the butterfly valve. It's shown the valve open at the moment with the solenoid de-energized. The valve is open. You've got the position micro switch there, similar to the 10th stage one. So um, it gives an indication when the valve is closed. Um, air is, goes up through a small filter to a control pressure reference regulator. 
<clears throat> where the pressure is regulated, it comes along to the solenoid. At the moment, the solenoid's de-energized, so it's going nowhere. But if we energize that solenoid, the air is then allowed to be ported to the back closing chamber of the actuator. It pushes down on the diaphragm and the spring, causing the valve to close. So this is the diagrams for the 14th stage valve and also the 14th stage isolation valve. Taking the top one first. So we have a power supply off the BC Buzz 1. So we know um, the valve is energized closed. So uh, the switch is shown in the closed position. So power comes through the switch, which is closed. It comes along to the solenoid on the valve and energizes it. The valve will close. And when the valve closes, the uh, micro switch will operate and, and the DC will pick up a ground signal um, when, it's, um, when it's closed. <clears throat> Normally though it's open, the 14 stage valve is open, so when it's open the switch contacts will open, they go into the opposite position that they're shown in the picture, and you'll lose that power going to the solenoid and so therefore it de-energizes and it will open. Um, we do need to close it though if we have an engine fire. So when you push the engine fire push button, that will re-establish that power to the solenoid and forcing it to close. Coming down to the 14 stage isolation valve, this is energized open. So when you push the valve switch, when you push the switch in, it hooks up power to the solenoid, it energizes it and it opens up. Once it's opened up, the micro switch operates, the DC picks up a ground signal, and it now knows that the isolation valve is open. It can then instruct the lamp driver unit to illuminate the open light. Doesn't matter about engine fire, because if we have an engine fire, we, we will probably want to open the isolation valve. We're gonna shut down, obviously, the engine that's on fire, but we're gonna open up the isolation valve and allow the other system to feed the 14 stage ducting on that side through the isolation valve. So the fire doesn't come into it. The fire doesn't come into it. We're going to look at the bleed air leak detection system right now. And as we saw from those previous pictures, the almost the entire system, once the pipe work gets onto the aircraft, the whole system is monitored for leaks. So Downstream of the shutoff valves, basically anything downstream of the shutoff valves is uh, checked out for leaks using uh, sensing elements or loops similar to the fire detection system, thermal switches, um, and they will trigger an ICAST message showing roughly to the crew where the leak is, you know, whether it's in the main supply duct, whether it's in the fuselage, whether it's in the wing. So to do that, we've got a bleed air leak, a bleed air control panel, and on there is a uh, test switch. Um, we've got two bleed air leak detection units, one for the left, one for the right, that, that, monitor, that do the monitoring. We've got sensing elements and <clears throat> also switches, and we have 38 thermal switches altogether. On the bleed air, um, control panel, we've got a duct monitor rotary selector, and this is used to test the bleed air leak system. Um, and when you put the switch to the test position, it does a continuity check of all the sensing elements, and then the test results are displayed, giving you a positive indication that it's passed the test. So not all of the bleed leaks that can occur will be detected by the bleed air leak detection system. But with the other systems that we have, so the engine fire protection system and the jet pipe and pylon overheat system, pretty much all the pipe work is monitored from the moment it leaves the engine to the moment it goes and does the wing anti-ice or whatever it is. <clears throat> The detection units are in the avionics bay. They are both identical. We've got one for the left system and one for the right. And inside them, there will be four circuit boards in each one. Each one of those circuit boards can monitor inputs from two sensing circuits. 
with the exception of the left and right duct, the 10 stage segments, all the circuit boards receive inputs from a single sensing element or thermal switch. Circuit, well, a series of thermal switches. <clears throat> the other input is grounded, but on the 10th stage, it's a dual loop system. On the 10th stage duct, it's a dual loop system. So the sensing elements consist of uh, a solid nickel conductor insulated with a porous aluminium oxide ceramic encased in an ink canal tubing. The tubing has hermetically sealed at both ends. The voids and clearances between the tubing, ceramic insulators and conductors are saturated with a salt compound to give the desired alarm temperature. So it's working in the same way as the fire detection system on the engine. When the loop is exposed to an overheat condition, the impedance of the center conductor and the outer conductor drops sharply as the alarm uh, uh, temperature is reached. At this point, the detection unit is activated to produce an alarm signal. Now then, the difference though between this bleed leak controller or detector unit and the one in the fire, if you remember the one in the engine fire, the one in the engine fire has a circuit that can detect a short circuit and differentiate between a short circuit and an overheat condition. The bleed air leak detection system can't do that and a short circuit will give the same alarm signal as a overheat condition. And we'll look at what we can do to mitigate that issue a bit later, because what we don't want to do is for the crew to shut down the bleed system unnecessarily because of a, a faulty sensor. So this is why they have a dual loop system in the uh, main ducting. Thermal switches, there are 19 on each side, 38 altogether. <clears throat> the contacts of the switch close when the temperature gets to more than 232 degrees, uh, 32 degrees C. Should a piccolo tube rupture, the hot air will impede on at least one thermal switch, causing it to close and activate the warning. And then it automatically resets once the temperature drops below the threshold temperature. So, so this chart just shows you the trip points for the um, different areas. So uh, starting at the top, the left and right wing thermal switches, that's, the, that's set to the hottest temperature because effectively it's leaking all the time anyway because it's monitoring where the piccolo tube, so it will get hot in that area, it's designed to, but obviously not excessively hot. So the temperature of the trip temperature is 232. The left and right fuselage, so that's the pipework running down from, from, from the engine really, down the fuselage towards the wing. There shouldn't be any leaks there at all. And then the, don't forget the pipes are insulated as well. Um, so that's set to 123 degrees C. And then the left and right ducts for the 10th and 14th stage ducting. So that's from basically the pylon into the after equipment bay. Um, they're both set to 154 degrees C. So here we can see the components. We can see where the left and right bleed leak detection units are. They're in the avionics bay. We can see the pipework um, and um, the pipework running from the engines down to the wing and then along the piccolo tubes. <clears throat> the bottom part of the picture there where it shows where the thermal switches are. So the thermal switches will be in the um, um, wing area and then the, the normal leak detector sensor loop runs sort of alongside the pipe. Now we said the pipes uh, were made from titanium and then they're covered with an insulator material and then the outer part of the insulator material is wrapped in a thin stainless steel covering. Obviously if the actual pipe ruptures um, we need to direct the leaking air onto the leak detector. So on the outer covering of the stainless steel cover you'll find a series of holes in the actual insulating material and this is to allow the air to vent out from the actual physically ruptured pipe. And the holes are directing the air onto a leak detector, either the switch or the um, um, uh, sensing element loop. Although actually, to be fair, the switches are in the area of the actual wing and that, that is a piccolo tube area, so that's not actually covered with an insulator. 
So this picture shows the two detection units. And as we said, each one contains four separate circuit cards that have the capability to monitor two inputs, but three of them are only monitoring one. And the second channel, if you like, is just shorted to ground and is redundant. The, the circuit card that's monitoring the duct, the 10th stage duct, um, is monitoring two loops, loop A and loop B, and both loops have to be in a overheat condition for it to release the leak warning. Now, we said that unlike the engine control unit, the bleed air leak detection unit cannot differentiate between a shorted loop and a loop that's um, properly leaking. It can't, it can't see the difference. Um, and because it's a dual loop system, normally it would need both loops for it to, it's just showing an overheat condition for it to release the bleed leak message. Potentially, one loop could be shorted out because of a fault, and no one would know anything about it <clears throat> because it's not going to release that fire signal until it gets a short or um, a tr it gets to the trip point of the second loop. So we need to be able to monitor that and test it. So on the duct monitor rotary switch, there's a loop A position and a loop B position. If you put it to loop A, if you rotate that switch to position loop A, what it does, it shorts out loop B. It shorts out loop B. It creates a short circuit on loop B. Now, if loop A is good, you, nothing will happen. <clears throat> there won't be any output because loop A, it, loop B is shorted, but loop A is uh, okay. But if loop A was shorted as well, as well, you put it to loop B, it shorts out on purpose loop B. If loop A is shorted because of a fault, you've now got two, effectively two shorts. You've got a short on loop B because you've created one and you've got a short in loop A because there's a fault. It's now gonna release the leak message. So this is how we can pick up any dormant um, failures. So you put it to loop A, it shorts out loop B. And if you put it to loop B, it shorts out loop A. And it will then, if there's no output when you do that, you'll get a loop A test OK message or a loop B test OK message. <clears throat> the other test position, the one that just says simply test, what that does, it's testing the continuity of all the loops to make sure there's continuity. If there was a short circuit in one of the other sections, not the 10th stage one, but if there was a short circuit in one of the other sections, then you're gonna know about that because you're gonna have a permanent bleed leak um, message on the display because it's shorted out and the detector unit will say, oh, there's a leak and it releases the signal. But for the loop A and loop B one, you won't know about the short circuit on one of the loops until you test it. And that's what the rotary switch does. So you put it to loop A, it shorts out loop B, you, and hopefully the, you don't get an output, and that shows that loop A is okay. You put it to loop B, it shorts out loop A, <clears throat> and monitoring loop B, and then you'll get the loop B test okay message. When you put it to the test position, it does a continuity test of everything, and everything is good, you'll get the test OK message displayed. So here, here are the indications you get then when you're testing. So you rotate the duct monitor switch to the test position. That does a continuity test of the sensing elements and the wires that join all the thermal switches. If the sensing elements are good and the circuit is continuous, you'll get the duct test OK green advisory message um, will be displayed. In addition, all four duct fail lights on the bleed air panel will also illuminate. The left and right 10th stage duct and the left and right 14th stage duct and the anti-ice duct red ICAS messages will appear and the bleed air duct voice message will be sounded. If there's an open circuit when you do the test, you won't get the duct, duct test OK message. 
and you won't get the appropriate duct fail lights, the red, the red lights, they will not be activated. Now, since both loops of the 10th stage must be um, shorted or heated in a trip condition in order to indicate a warning, it is possible that a single loop may be shorted and not give any indication. <clears throat> so we now put the switch to loop A or loop B. If you put it to loop A, it shorts out loop B and brings up the loop A test OK message. If loop A is shorted when you do this test, the appropriate right or left 10th stage duct fail light will illuminate and the left 10th stage duct message will appear with all the related warnings. If the loop A test, the loop A test OK message obviously won't appear. Similarly, when you go to loop B, it shorts out um, uh, loop A's and brings up the loop B test OK message. And if loop B on either side is shorted, then the warnings will occur. So it will, you will find out um, which side it is and you know roughly what area it's in. So if the 10th stage duct fail lights illuminates and the 10th stage duct, the left 10th stage duct ICAS message appears while selecting loop A, then loop A of the left hand duct is shorted out. If all loops are serviceable, then no warnings are activated. No warnings are activated and you get the loop A and loop B test OK displayed. And the normal position for the duct monitor switch is obviously in the normal position. Any uh, overheat event is logged as a maintenance message. This is important because obviously once uh, the crew have dealt with the situation, they might isolate the anti-ice system, they might turn off the bleed system, um, everything cools down and then all the cockpit indications will go away. So any event is logged and you can go in and you can see where the event occurred. So, well, roughly speaking, so left fuselage duct, right fuselage duct, the wing duct, the 10th stage duct or the 14th stage duct. Um, it, unfortunately, it doesn't break it down any smaller than that. So it's still quite a large area to look at. But it gives you the, in terms of troubleshooting, but it gives you a rough idea where the leak occurred. Some of the ultra modern systems can actually narrow down where the leak is coming from to the nearest you know, couple of centimeters or stations. But unfortunately, this one can't. So it gives you a rough area of where the leak is, but um, so you still need to do a little bit of uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, to, to find the actual leak. OK, well, there, that's it for the pneumatic system. What we're going to look at next is the air conditioning system. Um, so we'll see you on the next bit.